just got an illustration there. Never listen to the numbers I say. Look at the board. The board is right, not the numbers that I speak. Um, well, we make our beginning, as always, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. C.S. Lewis, in the first grown-up book that I ever read, The Chronicles of Narnia, wrote that there is effectively nothing sadder than a winter without Christmas. In a winter without Christmas. If there's nothing sadder than a winter without Christmas, and uh, maybe uh, someone, um, it's a little warm in here, if uh, one of the people who knows how to work the fans can put the fans on, I think we'd appreciate that. Jamie, do you know how to do that? Thank you, sir. Or Doug, you, or, what, someone will get it. Nothing sadder than a winter without Christmas. And if there's nothing sadder than a winter without Christmas, what about a Lent without Easter. What about those 40 days of Lent, those 40 days of wandering, those 40 days in the wilderness without the good news of the resurrection, the good news of hope, the good news of new life? That's what Thomas was experiencing. The news had gotten to all the other disciples that, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. They knew that. They met with him. They either saw him at the tomb or saw him later on. But Thomas was a little bit busy. He was occupied with his own thing, with his own business. And so he missed the memo. He missed the message. And so when the disciples came to him and said that Christ was risen, that you don't need to be sad anymore, that our Lord is alive, that you are alive, that you have new life. Thomas was like, what kind of a wicked, twisted prank is this? No one can rise from the dead. Except... Jesus had told Thomas on more than a few occasions and told the disciples that he would rise from the dead. And Thomas had, with the other disciples, witnessed people being raised from the dead. But still, for someone who they saw die in a brutal way to rise from the dead, that was a little bit much to behold, a little bit much to believe. And so there was Thomas. Thomas missed the memo. He missed the message. He missed the words of Christ. These are good words. He said to them, peace be with you. And peace is what Thomas did not have in this moment. He was, he said, well, he probably was thinking, well, I saw my Lord die. I saw Jesus die. Am I next? Are they going to get me next? And so he met with the disciples in, uh, inside in probably the same upper room that they had their last supper. And he probably thought, well, they're meeting to plan the next steps. Are we going to disperse? Are we going to hide? Are we going to go underground? How are we going to save ourselves from Caiaphas, from Pilate? from the Sanhedrin, from those same people who killed Jesus. They're going to come after us next. And so Thomas was afraid. Jesus butted in. He tends to do that, and when he does, it is always good. He said to them, peace be with you. We say that from time to time in church, and it means Sundays, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Many churches, they have a handshake greeting, peace be with you. Uh, I don't always like that. Sometimes that turns into social hour here in church and distracts us from what should be going on. But what does that mean, peace? What is peace? There's a great hymn, When Peace Like a River, Attendeth My Way, When Sorrows Like Sea Billows Roll. That hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was written by a man who had just lost everyone, his wife, his children. And yet he could say, it is well with my soul because he had peace. Peace that only Christ 
could give. Thomas needed that peace. And so do we. We live in a world of war and not simply talking about what's going on in Ukraine or overseas, but we live in a world where we are sometimes at war with ourselves, where we're struggling with various things, with temptations, with sins in our own lives. And we know what's good, we know what we should be doing, but we don't always do it. We don't always live lives that are preached as sermons. Sometimes we do what we ought not do, and there is this war inside of ourselves. Sometimes we think that the darkness has won, that our dark side has won, but what did we learn on Good Friday? Even when it seems that the darkness has won, there is always one light of hope. What did we learn on Easter Sunday? That light always conquers the darkness. And that Christ's peace always reigns even in the midst of our troubled lives. And so Jesus said to Thomas, peace be with you. Can you imagine Thomas at that moment? My goodness. <laughs> no, I'm not saying anything. Because he was probably speechless in that moment. Wait, the others were right? Someone really rose from the dead? Peace be with you. And then he says something really wonderful. There's this great painting. It's by Caravaggio. Called The Incredulity of Thomas. Where Jesus is beckoning Thomas to inspect the holes in his hands. The late Roman Catholic Archbishop preached this text, I think, just about better than anyone I've ever heard. And he said that uh, if someone makes a statement that which I need to believe, and if I need to see evidence, I want to see some scars. I want to see some marks of love. I want to believe in something that is worth believing in. There is nothing worth believing in more than the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. There is nothing worth believing in more than the fact that God has come down to earth to love you, to forgive you, to redeem you, to never let you go. And so, Jesus says to Thomas, do not be incredulous, do not disbelieve, but believe. You've seen me, says to Thomas. What does he say to us? Every week now I'm uh, putting up a little sign out in front of the church. Thanks be to God for dry erase markers. It allows me to use the same, uh, the same sign week after week after week. But I put on there the theme for this coming Sunday. Maybe someone will come by and be interested in it. And the theme this Sunday, I said, is Jesus for the skeptic. Jesus for the one who doubts. Of course, I joked earlier, what a thing to have on your tombstone. What a thing to be remembered by doubting Thomas. What a way to go down in history. You know what Thomas did? He brought the gospel to India. Christians in India, the earliest Christian community even today, are known as the St. Thomas Christian because tradition holds that he left the Holy Land and he journeyed to India to bring the gospel to the subcontinent. So remember him as faithful Thomas, as missionary Thomas, as, as brave Thomas. Because it is our natural state to have doubt. It is our natural state to be skeptical. And sometimes skepticism is certainly healthy. But it is only by the grace of God that the contact lenses, the cataracts of doubt are removed from our eyes so that we can see more clearly than ever before, so that we can see what is true, what is good, and what is eternal. It's only by the grace of God that we can do that. 
And so even though, yeah, Thomas, he was a doubter and he was a skeptic, he still came to faith in the same way that we did. God brought him there. Just as God brought you to faith. Our epistle lesson this day spoke about this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testified because the Spirit is truth. Dear saints, your Christian journey began in the waters of holy baptism. Our, our, font, our baptismal font is quite big here, quite bulky here. But it's too bad it couldn't live up here a little bit more often because that's a good reminder of where our Christian faith and where our Christian journey began. In the waters of the Holy, Bapti in the waters of Holy Baptism, where just as the Spirit of God came upon Jesus in his baptism, so also did the Spirit of God come upon us and dwell within us and create faith in us. Thomas is no different than you or me. Thomas is no different than us. We have the same doubts, we have the same fears, we have the same worries. We have the same sins. <clears throat> and so God does for us what he does for Thomas. He comes down to us. His Holy Spirit comes upon us, creates faith, nourishes faith, sustains faith. It says that, this, that the Spirit testifies. Spirit testifies in our hearts of the truthfulness of this divine and good and gracious gospel. And so we join then with Thomas in crying out, no longer silent, but moved to speak, my Lord and my God. You're here. You're right in front of me. You come to me in this word. And on our communion Sundays and the sacrament of the altar, you are here, you are near, I am not alone. You are not alone. Thomas walked in fear before he knew that Jesus was alive. Thomas walked wondering if he'd see the next day. Because he knew that forces of darkness were going to get him. And if those forces of darkness could claim his teacher, his Messiah, could they also get him? But now, in light of the resurrection, Thomas sees Jesus differently. Not simply as teacher, not simply as master, but as Lord and God. And if you see Christ the same way, your fears are subsumed into peace, just as Thomas's was. Because you know that nothing can harm you. Because your God went to hell to declare victory over the devil. Your God rose again to declare victory over death. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can stop you. Surely, we visited together on Monday. And you said... This was the first Easter Sunday that I haven't been in church. Remember what I said? I said you were in a very special place because you got to experience resurrection right in front of your eyes Amen. as you got to see Jeff go home to be with his Savior. Jeff is alive. Jesus is alive. The good news is there for him. Just as Jesus conquered death, Jeff has conquered death because Jesus allowed him to. And so you who may walk in sorrow, I ask you how you're doing today. You said I'm doing just fine because you know where Jeff is. That he's alive. This, dear saints, is something worth believing in. That Shirley's son, Jeff, is alive this day. That those whom you love is alive this day. That Jesus is alive this day. And Jesus said to Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. Because this is something worth believing. This is a belief 
that makes the devil shake in his boots. This is a belief that shatters tombstones. This is a faith that sees you home, that allows you to rise again. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Jeff is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Have faith, because this is something worth having faith in. Amen.